congratulations to yourself, Marsha, and thanks for agreeing to um, do a short video for SESN. Uh, congratulations to Scottish Women's Aid uh, on your achievements with the new Domestic Violence Act. Uh, what difference then uh, do you think that this could make in Scotland? Well, Scotland's new Domestic Abuse Act, which is what we call oh, it in sorry. Scotland, um, uh, has the potential to really transform a lot of real, really large scale problems in Scotland um, and possibly more optimistically to help Scotland do uh, what it says on the tin in our equally safe policy, which is uh, addressing the elements of discrimination and um, inequality that drive uh, so many so many harms in Scotland, but most particularly violence against women and girls, and I would say probably the largest scale problem within violence against women and girls is domestic abuse. So it really there is a potential for that. Um, it's been called our new law has been called by Evan Stark, who literally wrote the book Coercive Control, um, uh, as the world's new gold standard. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a lot to live up to. The, the, the elements of the bill that are um, critically different from any legislation we've had in the past is that it's a course of conduct offense, which means that it, um, it's required to, you're required to demonstrate that there's been at least two, so to speak, incidents um, that will be no problem in the context of course of control, which is a 24 seven um, phenomenon. Um, and uh, really importantly, that uh, criminality extends beyond physical assault to all, all kinds of emotional and psychological uh, controlling behaviors. And uh, we're really excited to see that we have already got some convictions and it just was implemented the 1st of April. So um, watch watching this space with great optimism at the moment. Uh, the other thing about it that is really innovative is its treatment of uh, children under the child aggravator. And uh, that will be really new, really new for Scotland, for criminal courts, for uh, prosecution, for lawyers, for children's advocates who will need to be supporting children through, um, we suspect, through some of the evidence gathering and giving processes. Um, and that's uh, in part because we have the language in our bill is that th essentially makes clear that children can be harmed by domestic abuse, whether they're in the house or the country <coughs> or wherever, that it's, um, if they're in the family and there's domestic abuse, they're being harmed by it. Yeah, great. Um, so what would your main reflections be on equally safe, uh, given that you were involved from early on? Um, uh, well, I mean, Scottish Women's Aid has always been involved in development of violence against women policy, um, uh, has driven a lot of it, the women's aid movement generally, um, along with the right crisis movement, I think. Um, so we are, and we've had equally safe for a few years now. The, the um, I think the element that makes us uh, more excited about this um, policy than the previous ones, even though there's a lot of it that's quite the same. We, you know, since the Scottish government got devolved powers again around violence against women and girls, since you know, since 1999 when the Scottish Parliament created some Scottish pol distinct policy. Uh, we've used a UN approach, which is um, citing violence against women and girls in the context of historical discrimination. So and there's a beautiful phrase for it. It's that um, violence against women and girls is the cause and consequence of women's inequality. And you can flip that around women's inequality, the cause and consequence <coughs> of violence against women. So, um, so that is, that is that we were the first in the UK maybe the first in Europe to, to use that policy framing. But what Equally Safe gives us that we haven't really had before is that it moves from saying, oh, well, this problem is cited, you know, is contextualized by this historical um, uh, path to saying, okay, well, actually what this means then is that to end domestic abuse and sexual assault and forced marriage and all of the forms of violence against women, we need to be much more serious about ending women's inequality. Yeah. 
and um, that included that you know a primary work stream on primary prevention, which looked at uh, uh, making a plan for in, you know <laughs> for cha for ending the the existing discrimination, and and I think more importantly on the short term for making transparent the links between the fact that women are more likely to be poor, they are more, much less likely to be in positions of power and, and influence, uh, and they are much, um, in, they have much less safety in their personal lives. So the, the facts of how those operate to allow for a culture in which, you know, one out of four women in Scotland experience domestic abuse and probably one out of four men perpetrate it. Yeah. What do you think community safety and community planning partnerships could do to improve things and drive forward the equally safe agenda? I think it's it's an area where we really need a lot of work. Um, I think, first of all, violence against women partnerships are um, work really well in some parts of Scotland and uh, much less well in others. And the ones where they don't work so well, I think, are the ones where there's, there's, there's real problems with multi-agency working and with um, a partnership approach to solving what are, you know, probably the single biggest driver of ACEs, for instance, in Scotland. So, um, and I think community justice elements, community safety partnerships could um, take a real lead in uh, working closely with violence against women partnerships. I remember when I worked in West Lothian and it was really difficult to connect the two. Um, you, you know, we'd have, you'd have one person come from one network and that's never enough. Yeah. Um, so it would be really refreshing and possibly really um, uh, helpful if, if violence against women partnerships and community safety partnerships sat down together across Scotland and said, you know, we know that that domestic abuse and the rape and sexual assault are so-called wicked issues in Scotland. We've not made any inroads into the prevalence of either one. Um, and, and frankly, it can't be done at the national level. It has to happen at the local level. And it has to happen, especially in these days of scarce resources and local cuts, um, by people working together. And one of the biggest problems that we have, I think, is that we've got some really good practice in Scotland, but it's often um, isolated in one sector. So in health or in social work or in police. And But what we don't have is a consistent approach across the sectors so that women and children uh, know that they're going to get the, the same response no matter where they go. And, you know, whatever's in the gift, whether they need housing or whether they need a protection order or, or, you know, whether they need alcohol and drug, um, if you're, you know, alcohol and drug services, that you're going to, to be listened to, be believed, get, get informed help instead of somebody's personal version of it, and then not drop off the table when you want move from one institution to another. Yeah. So I think those are some beginning places. And in the places where the partnerships are working really well, um, then people need to be bold and they need to do something different. Because if we continue to do what we've got, we've done, we are going to continue to have one out of four victims of domestic abuse, you know, and one out of four perpetrators. What do you think might be amongst the potential benefits of gender analysis data? Well, I mean, it's, if you don't gender your understanding and your policy and your interventions, you have failed policy and failed interventions. I mean, it's, you know, it's not, oh, good people do this and bad people do that. I mean, effective people do it. And that's why we have a public sector equality duty that says you need to do an equality impact assessment. And when you do an equality impact assessment, you need to say, uh, you need to analyze, you, you know, any policy or service um, based on uh, who's going to be affected and what what what's the evidence about who's affected and you know how our intervention will or won't um, uh, improve or uh, harm the status of people with protected characteristics. So a good example. Um, so 
when, you know, Scottish Women's Aid works in the area of domestic abuse and what are services that are helpful. Uh, we have a network of refuges available uh, for women and children. We don't provide them for men. And part of the reason that we don't is that there's a, a significant significant and growing body of evidence that said men who experience some form of abuse, domestic abuse, um, uh, have very different needs than women. Now that would be no surprise to anybody, you know. First of all, their, their victimization is very different. Their status in their community is usually very different from other victims. Their perpetrator is very often another man, so that let, you know adds a whole level of stigma to it. And they, they need a lot of things, but what they don't need is refuge. So if we want to serve them well, then we need to gender our analysis and we need to be aware that every single thing we do has a gender dimension. Great. I think the most useful thing would be to take a look at what's in their gift and get moving. Um, if, if we know that the single biggest thing that survivors tell us is helpful is to be believed when they disclose. And that the probably the most helpful thing that we can do with survivors is to help give them more control over the pieces of their life that the abuser has taken control away from. Um, then we, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is it that women tell us they really need? And they're really very simple, you know. They need, they might need a new mobile phone. They might need, um, uh, they might, they will almost for sure if they have children need uh, accessible quality childcare uh, when, when they need it rather than when it's easy to provide it. Uh, they will need a safe house, preferably a house that's safe because the perpetrator has been removed rather than because they've had to move multiple times sometimes. You know, they need the really very basic things that every human being needs that the inequality and domestic abuse have taken away from them. So it's not rocket science. It is a bit about people taking responsibility for doing the things that they can do. And almost all of those things are in the gift of the local groups and local partnerships. Um, I think, you know, as I said, Scotland has such an alcohol problem and sadly has quite a drug problem too, that um, it's very difficult to, f to find um, uh, evidence of, uh, you know, violent behaviors or any other kind of negative behaviors that don't occur in the context of, you know, don't co-occur in the context of alcohol or drugs. Um, and uh, I think we, we have tended for a long time, because I think we now accept that Scotland has a, has a terrible alcohol problem and that we need to do something about it as communities, as families, as governments, etc. cetera. Um, as individuals. Yeah, as individuals. <laughs> that, um, you know, that therefore everything is caused by alcohol. Yep. Uh, and it's, it's a bit of a cop-out, really. Um, and I think... But it's also a complex question, we, and I would say that in Scottish Women's Aid, we really worry that, that, that people put together this notion that somehow alcohol drives domestic abuse. Uh, and, and while people will, will say, no, well, it doesn't cause it, you know, um, I don't think they really understand what it does do. And I, and I would say that the evidence, the best evidence we have says that, that alcohol, the drinking, is cultural permission giving in Scotland. So um, we know that we have a long history of, of tolerating uh, violent behavior in the, the, when it happens in the context of drinking um, in public spaces and in private spaces. Uh, and I think uh, quite a bit like the way old firm games and football works, the, the, because there's an expectation now that, that there will be some kind of bad behavior in the context of these things that we then associate them as drivers of it. But actually we think, you know, it's never, you know, for a really long time anyway, in Scotland, it's never been okay to, to physically assault 
anyone, and in particular, your family. But there was an awful lot of saying, well, it's the drink. You know, it's the drink. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. It's the drink. Well, we know that you can you can help people, you know, reduce their alcohol dependence, and and, um, uh, and we should, and we need to do that. But there's really very little evidence that that's going to have any impact on their controlling behaviors or on their abuse because abuse is not a phenomenon of anger it's not a it's not a loss of control it's an exertion and, and a high need for control we, we need to get away from thinking that somehow even though we don't say it causes it that alcohol does cause it we need to provide lots and lots of services and get much better at reduce i'm a big fan of minimum pricing for instance yeah. but what we can't do is fool ourselves that that we that we then can cannot take responsibility and accountability for what are the biggest drivers probably of harm in our communities which will be um, abuse well I mean, I think one of the things we've been talking a lot about in because of our new domestic abuse law is that uh, abuse uh, is often not physical or it might be physical at the beginning to set out what the consequences of breaking the rules are but but control is all about the rules yeah. so you know you can't call your mother you can't use your phone when i'm not here yeah. you know the kids aren't allowed to do this um all of the rules that somebody with a high need for control and a, a high sense of entitlement in a relationship might impose um and uh, but when there is physical violence, we do know, and there's convincing evidence that there are more severe injuries. And uh, because most violence in the context of domestic abuse is not severe, doesn't wind up in a doctor's visit. You know, um, it's routine and minor violence rather than life-threatening or, or serious injury related. Um, but for those that are, you know, our, our, our speculation is, the explanation for that is that there's obviously an impact when you do alcohol and drugs on motor control. Yeah. Um, and so an abuser who, who, is, who assaults a, a victim uh, and, and, ha and is sober, for instance, um, w will probably control the extent of the injuries uh, to whatever extent that, that he uh, knows that it provides safety or delivers the outcome that he wants with the violence, which is um, more control uh, and somebody who's been drinking a lot is not necessarily going to be as good at doing that yeah well you like you'll have thing. people who are controlling or not abusive yeah. and we I don't think we really know where that goes and yeah. you know how that develops um, because there's just not been enough research about it but um, I mean, I think there's two questions really that you're asking. One is what should we doing to prevent and what yeah. should we be doing to promote behavior change with, yeah. with and accountability, I would hope, yeah. with perpetrators. So the prevention question really is quite simple if you go back to equally safe. Yeah. So if you're really serious about primary prevention, then you'd best be taking care of the fact that one in four to one in five children live in poverty and child poverty in Scotland is women's poverty because they live in in single mother households so you know we so we need to be really serious about closing the pay gap about uh, making sure child care is available if we expect women to be in the paid labor market so that women um, can support their families and not live in poverty and not have really small set of uh, of options if they're experiencing abuse um, Prevention really needs to do what it says on the tin in Scotland, which is um, end women's inequality. That's the first question. The second question is, how do we how do we promote behavior change on the part of um, uh, abusers? And Scotland's got a um, a, a very well regarded and and uh, um, resourced, relatively well resourced uh, program behavior change program called the Caledonian. Yeah. Um, we need more resources for that. It, this, it's available and I think it's now been rolled out so that we'll have it in about two thirds of local authorities. Um, what we can be doing, first of all, is making sure that it's um, in, uh, implemented robustly and supported well enough so that it gets the, the outcomes that it can when it's run appropriately. 
we also need to be really, really careful about what's happening in those one third of local authorities where there's no program. And I would say that, um, that I know that criminal justice social workers are under a lot of pressure to do a perpetrator program. And if they don't have, weren't successful in bidding for a Caledonian program, they might be quite tempted to just take something off the shelf and do it. And I would ask them to be very, very careful about that because we do know that, um, that interventions that don't include a support mechanism for the partner or ex-partner who was the victim um, can be very dangerous. And, and also, especially to children in those contexts. So that's, I guess, my, my not very easy, but, you know, answer to both of those questions. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you mentioned there poverty and women's inequality being mm -hmm. the biggest driver of domestic violence. All forms of violence against all women. Forms of violence yeah. against women. Um, I, I, and it just brought to mind a quote from Christopher Hitchens where he said that if you want uh, a society to or an economy to develop, then the simple answer is to empower women mm -hmm. uh, across the world. Um, so I, I, much I, evidence. Yeah. So much evidence. So that would be the sort of central takeaway theme is that if we, yeah, yeah. If we can empower women in this country and And, reduce and I think a lot of people would be tempted to say, oh, well, that's in developing countries because, you know, women can read in Scotland. But actually, there's, you know, if you look at the spirit level evidence and all of the stuff about linking um, uh, Im improved outcomes in a country with um, equality, then absolutely the messages are just as loud for developed countries. So I think... Um, you know that, that we will solve a host of problems if we address the the problem of women's inequality and the intersectional ones of race and uh, sexual orientation and disability. I mean, we, you know, we see those those absolutely evident in in all of, almost all the cases of domestic abuse that we that we know of.